PT series mostly consisted of low-end kids toy keyboards, starting with the little PT-1, which was more of a toy for toddlers, and then a lot of models similar to the PT-80, which I've shown before. One similar feature I've noted across most of the PT models is that they're monophonic, meaning you can only press one key at a time. But starting, I believe, with the PT-100, which I was lucky enough to get for Christmas in 1987, uh, they started making the PT series polyphonic. Now, the PT-180 follows in this by having six voice polyphony, and I consider this to be a major enhancement compared to the previous models. So as a kid, I was never able to learn or understand chords because I wasn't able to play them on my old PT series. Well, I sort of could because the PT-80 had these special chord buttons on the side and you could create any chord you wanted. The trouble was I could create a major or minor chord here, but ultimately I didn't understand how that translated to actually playing a major or minor chord on a real piano. So while it is polyphonic, there's still one thing that really annoys me about this keyboard, and that's the range of notes that it has. Um, sure, it has 32 keys, and you might think, looking at the full piano keyboard, that it would fall right here in the middle, but they didn't do it that way. Instead, it's higher up on the keyboard like this, meaning there are no bass notes and barely any mid-range notes to play. They don't give you any way to transpose the keyboard down either. All of the Casio keyboards were like this, and I don't know if they just thought that kids preferred the sound of the higher notes or what. Speaking of keys, you may notice that the PT-180 has larger keys than the older PT series. For example, both of these keyboards have 32 keys, but you can clearly see the 180 has a wider keyboard. This puts the keys at the same size you would have found on the MT series or the Super Drum series. There are just fewer of them. That tends to suggest that the target audience for this keyboard was probably a few years older than the target audience for these. The PT-180 only has eight instruments to select from, and since there's so few, I'll let you hear them all right quick. I'll just go from left to right, starting with the piano. The piano's okay, but the harpsichord is terrible. It doesn't even sound like a harpsichord, it sounds like a pipe organ, you know, like it should be playing like... Of course it does have a pipe organ. And it sounds more like a reed organ. The violin is my favorite instrument on this keyboard, probably because it has some sustain to it. And here's the flute. And here's the clarinet. Uh, this is called reed. But it sounds more like a sawtooth lead or something. And last, here's the Celesta. I like it. Now, one thing I noticed is that the flute and the Celesta are both transposed up one octave higher. Now, this is obvious if you switch between the two instruments and you can hear that I press a C here and then switch to the other instrument and play a C that's one octave lower, it's the same note. The PT-180 uses the same ROM packs that many other Casio keyboards from the era use. Now, these ROM packs are designed to help people learn to play music. Many ROM packs list the song names on the cartridge, but some have more than 20 songs on them, so they just can't print all the names, so they'll just say something like, fun with your Casio keyboard instead. 
If you just want to hear the songs, you can put the keyboard into auto play mode, and you'll see the LEDs racing across the keyboard waiting for you to pick a song. The keys themselves are the numbers, so this is a 1 for example, and then the next key here is a 2, and then 3, and so on. So I'll pick song number 5, which is a horrible rendition of the Star Wars theme tune. The ROM packs contain a monophonic melody, meaning there's never more than one note played at a time. It also contains a monophonic backing track, and um, of course a rhythm selection, a chord selection for the accompaniment, and a tempo. Now the songs can actually sound somewhat different depending upon which keyboard you use to play them back on. So for example, listen to this same song on the PT-80. Specifically, this part here sounds very different on the two. So I wanted to at least attempt a multi-track recording on this, but as usual I ran into the problem that there's no headphone or other line output jack. Well, if you've been watching my videos before, you'll know that I have a solution for that. Besides, I wanted to get a look at the interior anyway. Well, here we go. This board is very sparse compared to the PT-80 from a few years earlier. Apparently they consolidated most of the circuitry into this one chip here. I would also note the manufacturing stamp of June 1988. Technically, I don't need to remove the board in order to add a line output jack, but I really just wanted to get a look at it, and here we go. Uh, this is a single-sided board with traces only on the other side. This looks very cost-reduced compared to the earlier PT series. One thing I wanted to do is poke around at the keyboard matrix and see what I can find. Right away, I found some Easter eggs, as there are apparently chord buttons like the PT-80 had, but they don't physically exist on the keyboard. Uh, but you can clearly hear them here. Um, I was also able to find some more notes in a lower octave than what is available on the keyboard. I was inspired to try this after seeing the hacking data on Table Hooters website about the Casio PT100. He managed to map out the entire key matrix, uh, and all of the items in orange here are new features he found that aren't officially included with the keyboard. And I was most interested in the sustain on and off. I'd love to hack in a sustain button. The matrix on this keyboard is very similar to how a computer keyboard is laid out, where you have input lines and output lines, and then they all crisscross like this, and the CPU will send 5 volts to the output pins one at a time, and monitor the input pins to see which ones light up. So I would need to figure out which lines are input lines and which ones are output lines, and then figure out what all the combinations do. So I got out my multimeter and printed out a blank page with the matrix pins. My goal was to eventually map these out into a matrix, and I worked on it for about two hours and made some progress, but eventually realized this would take me a week or more to figure out which pins do what, so eventually I just gave up. However, if anyone else figures out if there is a sustain mode, then uh, please send me an email and I will revisit that topic. So I decided to get back to the line output modification. All I really need is this RCA connector and a capacitor. Now, people always ask me which value of capacitor I use, but the truth is the value isn't all that important. Now, I've used a different value almost every time I've done one of these mods. I just use what's laying around. Different capacitance values will somewhat affect the frequencies of sound, but for an application like this, the value really isn't all that important. And keep in mind that my line-out modifications are specifically designed so that I can hear the sound that's being recorded on the internal speaker while being able to record into my computer. Um, anyway, there we go. All done. Let's put it back together. Okay, so I wanted to do some sort of multi-track recording. Now, the challenge with this keyboard, of course, is the range of notes. So whatever I make is probably going to sound like somebody took your graphic equalizer and made it look like this. Nevertheless, I wanted to try, and since I like the violin on this keyboard, I decided to design my own song uh, based around that instrument. So uh, here goes. <laughs>
And so that about wraps it up for the Casio PT-180. It's a neat little keyboard and I'm glad to have it in my collection, but um, that's it for the moment. So uh, stick around for the next episode and thanks for watching.